Ariel, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, so great to be here. I'm excited. So I want to start with the founding story of H1. Can you give me a little bit about that? Um, well, sure. Uh, you want the 30-second or the two-minute? Minute and a half. Minute and a half. Okay, tough. So we, uh, I started a company before, which is called Research Connection. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how I learned about uh, H1 and the problem set. Uh, with Research Connection, um, our mission was to connect students to research activity. Mm -hmm. And so we'd profile every university in America and know what research, research was going on, and students would use that to know what research to get involved with. If you want to get a PhD, they would use uh, Research Connection. The thing that happened was companies were using it. I was getting very annoyed at them. So we had like Johnson & Johnson use our product. At the time, I was still in college, I didn't really understand I should charge Johnson & Johnson instead of telling them to get off of our product. But uh, I realized these companies don't know what research is going on in America. Mm -hmm. Big companies, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer. We ended up selling Research Connection. And with a similar team, I went to them, I was like, hey, all those companies that were using us, they clearly don't know uh, what research doctors are doing in the United States of America. What if we built LinkedIn meets Zoom Info for doctors? We profile every doctor in the world and tell you everything you want to know about them. We knew that medical schools, students, researchers, ourselves, we had no idea what research or what doctors were doing in America. Uh, what if we did that? And we were all like, yeah, sure, let's give it a shot. And that's how we started. I love it. I love it. So who are your primary customers today? So uh, that was the origin idea. Today, our mission is to connect the world to the right doctor. Mm -hmm. um, we work across the healthcare ecosystem. So today we have every doctor in the world and we can tell you everything you want to know about them. Uh, from who's the best cardiologist in New York City to Chicago, uh, who's the best one to do research with, who's the best one to go see, everything you'd want to know about a doctor. If you ever want a good info on a doctor, I, I can tell you. Uh, and so today our mission is free for patients, free for doctors forever, charge people that have money in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Pharma companies, governments, insurance companies, hospitals and health systems. Interesting. So uh, you said globally, connecting people globally. The recent news in the Middle East has been really interesting for you and your business because you've been able to connect people. I don't want to spoil the story, yeah. but, but please tell me more about that. So terrible what's happening in Israel, Gaza, the West Bank, Palestine. Um, that happened on a, October 7th was a Sunday. Uh, that Monday was Indigenous People Day and Tuesday, I was like, we have to do something. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled together a small team and I told them to reach out to every single doctor in the United States of America and ask them who wants to volunteer to go over to Israel. It was Israel at the time, which really, really the real crisis was. Israel didn't go into Gaza yet. Um, and we had no idea if there were any needs. This was like crisis mode. And I said, uh, reach out to every doctor in America and find out who's willing to go. And we did. And we got hundreds and thousands of volunteers. And then we were like, what do we do? There's nowhere to route them. And then I said, contact every doctor in Israel. And so we reached out to every doctor, every president of every hospital in Israel, and asked them, what are your needs? We'll help you. And uh, we started connecting doctors to hospitals in Israel, flying them over there, partnering with the Ministry of Health, non-for-profit organizations in Israel, and coordinating them flying over. Then we fast forward a week, the crisis was in Gaza. And we realized, all right, let's go reach out to everybody to see if they want to help and volunteer in Gaza. Reached out to everybody in America. We segmented it by people that speak Arabic or Hebrew. And then we got in contact with the World Health Organization, the U.S. State Department, and are, it's hard to get into Gaza now, but are trying to do what we need to do. And then we reached out to every doctor in Gaza and every doctor in the West Bank and said, where do you need help? And so we started making some of these connections and helping out where we can. And so to date, we're, we're literally like the... It's not our business goal, but like we are the ecosystem for how to get doctors from America over to the Middle East and Israel and Palestine right now. Wow. Um, and so it's heartwarming to see how many doctors want to go into the line of fire to help. Uh, so. That's incredible. Did you ever, when you started this, think that H1 could be used for kind of like a crisis health communications, or is that something no. you see you're going into in the future? <laughs> we just had a board meeting yesterday, and yeah. one of our board members was like, should we do this more? Right. And I'm like... Uh, maybe. Uh, I did this because I felt emotionally compelled to help and I thought we had a unique opportunity to. I think like uh, we were one of the maybe only company who could say reach out to every doctor in America and you could do that in 24 hours. Right. Uh, and then reach out to every doctor in Gaza, the West Bank and, Pal and uh, Palestine, Israel and you're able to do that within a week. Um, so I'm not sure but we're going to keep doing this until there's no longer a need and the crisis dies down and then we'll figure it out. Amazing. 
Um, switching gears a bit, I want to talk about AI, which is obviously top of mind for every company. You recently launched this new generative AI tool. Can you tell me about that and how you see AI working with the future of H1? Yeah, so when we started H1, I knew what people wanted. I know what you want, too. You live in New York. You want to be able to type in, here's all my data. Who's the best doctor? I should go see my shoulder hurts. That's exactly it. Everyone wants that. A pharma company wants to be able to type in, I'm running a clinical trial in non-small cell lung cancer. Tell me the 20 doctors to work with to make sure the trial runs successfully. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have to search and filter like what we did in 2006 and 2016. Uh, I've always wanted to do that. Now it is actually possible to do that. And so the first iteration of the product that we launched is for clinical trials. You can literally go in and type in, which doctors and which hospitals should I work with in my clinical trial and get an answer? Mm -hmm. And the answer is right. And it is game changing. The stat is with pharma companies, 30% of the doctors that get recruited to run a clinical trial recruit zero patients, which fail. Mm -hmm. uh, on average, it wastes billions of dollars a year. And so we hope to eliminate that loss, which what that means for patients is drugs get to market quicker, save lives, live healthier lives. And so we're excited about that. But that's the use case everyone wants. You're traveling to the UK, you want to know, you hurt your ankle, which doctor speaks English, takes my insurance that's, in, that's near me. You just want to type that in and get an answer. And so we're going to be, it helps achieve our mission. We're really excited about what generative AI could do for us Very and the cool. world. Yeah, absolutely. Now talk to me about your fundraising journey. How have you looked at raising capital and how much have you raised so far? So we are an interesting story. We bootstrapped it for two years. Myself and my co-founder bootstrapped for two years. Then we had a term sheet for our Series A, and we also got into YC. The partners at YC convinced us and said, don't take the term sheet. Guarantee you'll get a better valuation, better firm if you go into YC. We ended up going into YC. It was the last batch before the pandemic. We ended up raising our Series A and Series B that same year. We raised about 100 million bucks that year. And then 12 months later, raised our Series C. So we raised our seed A, B, and C in about 18 months. Yes, and so crazy times. <laughs> and now we are um, racing and managing towards profitability and the business is in a different stage. But bootched up for two years, raised 200 million bucks in 18 months, and now we're um, managing towards profitability. That's incredible, congrats yeah. on that. It was a roller coaster there those 18 months. Yeah, so we, we've talked about this before, but you know, you say you're not exactly like a, a Zoc Doc and you're not exactly like those other ones out there today, but who are your competitors and what are you doing that you think is totally different? ZocDoc's a cool company, and there's a use case for ZocDoc. I have a, a three-year-old. When I try and find a doctor for my three-year-old, I want to know if the doctor has good bedside manners, is kind, um, and that's what you want to know. How long's the wait time? Um, if you have a tumor in your brain, you will go to the meanest doctor in the world if they're the best at curing your tumor. It's a different use case, and so what we could answer is how good are they at their job clinically. Okay. It's a whole different, a whole different avenue uh, than Zo what ZocDoc and Vitals and others are able to do. Um, in layman's, like out of healthcare, competitors would be like what ZoomInfo or LinkedIn does. We have a mm. doctor network and we also curate information about doctors. Within the healthcare world, it's more like what Doximity does. People know Doximity or Viva or Acuvia. These are big businesses that not many people know about, like healthcare ones. So. Okay. And what are you doing differently than those? So the, the, there's really two approaches to this. If you think about LinkedIn versus ZoomInfo, uh, LinkedIn gets all their information on you and me because we input it. We have incentives to input it. Finding jobs, networking, reading content. ZoomInfo gets all their data because they curate it uh, themselves. You didn't, you're in ZoomInfo, but I'm in there. I didn't input my information there. Uh, the approach that we took was a combination of both. If our mission is to connect the world to the right doctor, eventually you'll need doctors to engage and contribute. But Dr. John Smith, who runs Harvard's Cancer Center, is probably busy. I still need him in there if he's the best medical oncologist up in Boston. And so we curate all this information and partner with governments, insurance companies, you name it, to aggregate everything you can ever imagine about a doctor. And then we asked Dr. John, do you want to update and claim your profile? And that was why we had the ability to reach out to every doctor in America and they knew about us in a day. Um, and so that, that combination of aggregating information and then engaging in community um, and we know more about these doctors than they know about themselves. They're shocked when we'd be like, yeah, you saw 16 patients last year with not small cell lung cancer uh, in the left, uh, left lung, and this is how you benchmark against other peers at your institution. And yeah. so the combination of both is really what's needed for our industry. Very cool. So what would it take for you to sell your company, and is that your big end goal? Uh, people ask that. Are you gonna I, I, it's funny, in almost every interview, are you guys going to IPO? When are you going to IPO? And I answer the same thing since we started the business. 
if I was doing this for the money, you wouldn't start a healthcare business. Uh, you might, <laughs> but it was not in vogue to start a healthcare business yeah. pre-COVID. Um, and uh, the goal is to achieve the mission. We are, we've raised like 200 million bucks. We have like 500 employees. And I tell everyone, you can measure a business in a few ways. Financial metrics, mm. easy. Scale, fundraising, uh, achievement of the mission. And uh, good business, generating a lot of revenue, 500 employees, raised quarter billion bucks. We have done like almost nothing to achieve our mission. And so we are like, if you think about the marathon was just in New York, 25, 26 miles. We didn't even finish mile one. Mm. Like how many people in this room and today uh, have used H1 uh, and helped them save a life in their family or they connected them to the right doctor or they took a therapy that we helped support that clinical trial? Not enough. Mm -hmm. And it's like we have a long way to go. If there's a company that accelerates us towards our mission, I'm always open to talking about it. But um, as of now, we've been able to move faster by ourselves. What is the next big thing for H1 on the horizon in, in 2024? We're going to be launching Gen AI across all of our products. Um, and so the first one that we launched is around helping you find the right doctor to run a clinical trial. The next one we're going to be launching, which helps support pharmaceutical companies as well, is helping them identify which doctors are not actually using the right medicine on their patient. Mm -hmm. When you're a good stat, 10% of cardiologists prescribe the right medicine to someone with a heart condition. Interesting. 10%? So, no offense to cardiologists, there's a fact out there. Uh, <laughs> And it sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. They were into med school 20 years ago, 10 years ago. They were taught about a drug, and medicine changes. It's like technology changes. And so they haven't adopted it. And so we're helping life science companies identify which doctors um, need additional education uh, to help use the latest medicine and technology. And, and so that's the next. You could ask the question, which cardiologists in Brooklyn uh, have used old therapies on patients and had bad patient outcomes? And get an answer. Wow. You want to know that too, by the way. A hundred percent, I think everyone does. <laughs> everyone does, yes. <laughs> and so we're launching that uh, in early next year, so which we're super excited about. Um, and so those are some of the things, but layering on Gen AI across our products, you can just ask those questions and get the right answer. We have the data, mm. Gen AI makes it possible to get the right answers. Very cool. And last question for you, Ariel. You've been on our under 30 list. Um, what advice do you have for other aspiring young entrepreneurs who want to be in the, the seat you're in today? Uh, do it only if you love it. It's a hard job. The HubSpot CEO just quit, and he said in his, he wrote like 20 lessons. The first lesson was uh, the CEO job is overrated. And it completely is. I mean, I, like, I love my job, I love what I do, but like, uh, I only do this, um, I don't for the money, I don't do it for any of that. I do it because I really enjoy it. I enjoy working with the people, I like the mission. And so if, uh, if you do something that you love, and it's like cliche, but if you do something that you like, you're gonna uh, do the best. Everyone that asks me like, should I take this job or this job, former employees, I'm like, do whichever one you're more interested in. If you do it because you make 90K versus 70K or something, it's a bad decision. Right. Optimize on what you're going to enjoy, because if you do, you'll work harder than everyone else. You do better. Um, so just pick something that you like, you're passionate about, and then you'll just do the good work anyways if you do that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the insight yeah. and the stats and the data. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, it was very fun. I appreciate yes. you taking the time.